Welcome to this uh, character streaming where we are going to be going through how to retopologize this character using the Quadro tool in Maya. We're not going to be doing any kind of manual or automatic retopology on this guy whatsoever. This is going to be all done in ZBrush. Sorry, in Maya. So I'm just going to give people a second or two to join and then we're going to get started with this one. The process is going to be quite simple. We can just talk about that while we're waiting for people to show up. The process is going to be first, we need to symmetrize the character because I sculpted it without symmetry, which you know is good fun, but it's also a bit of a pain to deal with when it comes to retop. We're not going to sculpt him, we're not going to apologize him twice. So, um, just going through and doing one side, and the retop here is all is entirely shape based, meaning that it's um, we're not having any additional things on him. So what we can do, we can retopologize one half and then we could just kind of conform that to the second half of him. So um, that's going to work quite well. What's really important to do before you uh, retopologize something is to just make sure the model is solid. What I mean by that, this is actually missing some stuff back here. The, the ear has the wrong thickness, but that will do for now. So for instance, if, you're, if the, your ear is too thick, then you're gonna have issues with subsurface scattering and such here because you're gonna have to, you can have basically an ear which is far, far, far too thick. So let's get started with this. We are going to first just delete lower subdivision levels. I have a total of almost 14 million polygons from this guy here. We could of course just um, leave that in but um, and decimate that, but it's just gonna take much longer. So then we do that and then we do a, uh, just do a little lower, delete higher, then we do a mirror and weld. Now you have to figure out which side, in this case, right? You have to figure out which side you're actually gonna base it off. I'm gonna base it off this side right here. So this is gonna look something like this. Then we have to decimate them. So we go to C plugin, and then we go to Decimation Master, and we can just click one of the presets down here. We don't need UVs or anything like that. 20K is plenty for this. And if you guys have any questions along the way as well, feel free, free to um, to ask them at any point. Very happy to take questions as well. This is going to be a little bit different than the other streams we've done, which have been focused on sculpting. This is going to be entirely focused on retopology. Then we go to um, tool, export, and then we're just gonna be exporting this guy out. I'm gonna definitely, definitely not put him in a delete me folder on the desktop. So, um, yeah, just gonna put him on my desktop. <laughs> just call him head. Actually, there we go. So then one thing you have to note before you bring stuff into Maya specifically is that if you were to bring in a model that has multiple polygroups like this, then this is going to screw up like crazy. This is going to import into Maya as a bunch of different pieces. So there are three main ways you can fix that. One you delete all polygroups. You just remove them straight. You can just hit auto groups. That works, of course, if you have only one model. If you have multiple pieces together like this, you just hit control W. Number two, you go to, you don't have to do all these, just one of them. Three, or number two, you go to preferences, import, export, and then under export, you disable GRP. This is going to not export subgroups. And number three is once we jump into Maya, you have to go to file, import, and then we definitely just have to go under here. I'm just gonna find this. So we find the folder like so, and then we have to force this to be OBJ, and then we have to go all the way down and set this to single object. This is going to import this guy as a single object. And then there we go. And now we have our little model. So um, yeah, nice and simple to bring it. Now what I highly recommend you do is you don't move anything around here. Like you, if you start to move him up, like so change his scale and such, then you're gonna be in trouble because you're gonna have to fix this in ZBrush later on, meaning that when you reproject from Maya now, is or you reproject from ZBrush onto this model here, it's not going to match perfectly. So you really wanna be sure that you fix the scale and position and everything like that before. And I'm just gonna disable the grid and we're gonna delete this guy here. We're just gonna call this head. Head, and we're gonna call this high poly. Just so we know what we are working with. And then we are going to, um, pop up the status line here. Then we are just gonna pop in and just save this guy. And uh, also <laughs> just on my desktop. <laughs> 
and um, there we go. Uh, well, here's a question. Is it possible to retopologize asymmetrical models? Uh, absolutely you can, but it's it's kind of stupid to be honest, because in this case here, the symmetry is um, is, is only shape-based, meaning the character is still a fundamentally symmetrical. It's just that um, he's pulling a bit of a facial expression and there's a bit of variation in him. So if you're trying to do that as a... Um, uh, you're trying to do that, then this is just annoying. So we might as well just do one side and mirror it over, and then we are going to uh, just get started with um, changing up the shape in Seabrush. So basically reintroducing the the, the asymmetry in Seabrush. So uh, unless the model is fundamentally asymmetrical, let's say you're doing a two-face, you know, of course, one side is a normal human, the other one is burnt, then you should just do one side. So then we go here and we set this to make live and then we go to the modeling toolkit and then we start with the quadro tool. I love the shape, uh, shape design and the sculpt so much. Thank you so much, so much. This, uh, <laughs> I'm having a lot of fun with this one, just really trying to make him nice and angular. This is what he looks like. Let's find ZBrush. Let's try to go back here. Yeah, this is what it looks like without. So uh, let me just show the model itself. Here we go. So this is this is what it looks like currently, with uh, with all his hair and his eyebrows. Still a bit work in progress. You can see here the the glasses are intersecting as well, and um, it's not fully done. But there we go. Do you can you read the apologize in Seabrush or do you need Maya? You can technically do it in Seabrush, but it's highly recommended against. Seabrush is not a retopology tool. So you don't need Maya. You can use Topogun, which is pretty cheap. Cheap. It's it's like a hundred, two hundred dollars. Don't know exactly. And you have Blender, which is obviously free, which has decent free topology tools. We have plenty of free tutorials on that on our YouTube channel. So any tool works, but you you need a retopo tool. So we can use Quadro. And the way I'm blocking out my topology is uh, I'm starting off incredibly light, and I'm just gonna actually use a. Uh, a tablet for this because I'm currently using a mouse and that's just going to hurt my hand <laughs> in the long term. So putting on a little sculpting glove and uh, then just working with a tablet now. So tablets are pretty handy when it comes to this kind of stuff. It's, for me it's far more, more ergonomical. So I'm going to start off blocking in the main loops. Like don't worry about starting in one specific spot and just working way out from there. Meaning you shouldn't just do the eye, then the ear, then the nose. Just, just block out the main loops. And when it comes to the final thing, you of course need stuff to be nice and square. But for this, it really doesn't matter. We're just blocking it out in the same way we're blocking out a sculpt. We're just going from general to specific. Then we just need to get a center line as well. We don't have to properly define exactly the coordinates for this right away because it's still so early. So we're just starting off by blocking in the loops we want. General to specific. The quarter tool is also dead simple to use. Also just a reminder that we have a uh, very nice back to uh, school say at flip normals. So we have a bunch of tutorials on uh, like all our flip normals exclusives are currently 30% off, currently 34 hours left off the sale. We have for instance, the newly released introduction to anatomy. We have tons of really, really good hard surface tutorials there. So just check out flipnormals.com for that. If you want to learn to sculpt as well, we have, for instance, an introduction to sculpting along with introduction to anatomy, which is going to provide you with a really solid foundation for uh, really for sculpting. First, just getting started with sculpting, knowing the tools, knowing the fundamentals of that, and then getting started with um, the, uh, the actual anatomy. So cool, let's continue with our topology. What you should do as well is you should match these loops up. This is why we're starting off with um, just with blocking in the loops because and, and not just like trying to match this up right away because that, it's not really important. We're just trying to block in the loops and then we'll start to like slowly match these guys up. But for now, don't worry about really matching things up for now. We are really designing the loop layout we want and you don't always know what that's like. Sometimes, of course, of course, you can use reference for that. You can find a base mesh for a human and you can use that just as reference or sometimes what you were doing if you were doing maybe a portfolio piece or, or maybe not a portfolio piece, but maybe 
a commercial piece. For portfolio pieces, it can be a good idea to do retopology by hand just to show that you know what you're doing. But for the moment you don't need to show that anymore, then you just start with a, a pre-made base mesh and then you just go from there. But uh, at least you might not know exactly the, the topology layout we're going for, so it's a good idea to experiment with this. Start off low poly. Really just start off as low poly as you can go. Is Maya best for retopology? It, it's hard to define what is best. It's good for retopology. It's a legit, really solid tool for retopology, meaning that if you use Maya, you can't go wrong with that. Like it's a fully professional tool for, for retopology. Personally, for me, I, I prefer Maya, but I've also done a significant amount of retopology in Modo, in Blender, and all sorts of stuff. Like it, 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 it's all really the same thing. The advantage of using a tool like Maya or Blender is that um, you have all the other modeling tools there as well. Well, some tools, I'm not entirely sure about like 3D code and such, but I believe they were mostly like just regular retopology tools, basically what we have here, the quarter and such. But sometimes you just need to like model something with regular topology, right? Or regular regular loops. So like you might just need to, if you have an arm, you might just need to start with a cylinder or you just might to just do some old school poly modeling, which is very, very useful to have in, in a tool like this. So I really prefer using Maya for this just because I have all the tools I need right here. But also it's good. It's it's legit a good tool for, for topology. Is it perfect? No, but it's very, very good. You just want to be sure to once in a while to go through and just delete your history <laughs> because it can get quite heavy. Before here, you can see tons of extrusions, so you just have to go in and just once in a while go in and uh, and do this. And here we have quarter tool. The cool thing about Maya is you can really model anything just using the shift right mouse button menu. You really have all the tools you need here, so you don't really need any any special menus or anything like that. Like in, in Maya, the marking menu system is fantastic. You know in Blender how if you need to model something, you need to either find in the menu or you need to essentially know the hotkey for it. In Maya, you don't really need that. So which means if you haven't used Maya for like two years, you just remember shift right mouse button and then you're going to have all the tools you need there. Control right mouse button for selection tools. Honestly, for me, it's been a very long time since I've actually used Maya because we, um, we've been using Blender mostly. But I just got into Maya again. Now we just got a, just uh, renewed a license recently. So now we have Maya again. And um, it, it's just it's instant to get back into me, from, to be honest, because I've been doing it for such a long time, but also because the system is so intuitive. It's not really memory based. It's more it's gesture based. So as long as you know what's um as long as you know the main gesture then you're going to be totally fine and then we're just blocking in the um, the main loops here so what the only thing i'm focusing on now is loop layout we're not focusing on on anything else it's also a tricky one what is good topology because it depends so much on on what you, you what you want to do. A good topology for VFX is not necessarily good topology for games and vice versa. Good topology for VR is probably not good topology for for like a, a statue for a background character. Right? It just depends entirely on what you what it is you're doing. Is there an option to smooth topology or work in Blender, like in Maya? Um, there isn't really an option to do that in like here, what you can do right you can just do this. And this and there isn't really an option to do that in, in Blender. Like you can use the smoothing brush and such, but like from the from the um, uh, the sculpting tools, but you don't really have a, a native smooth brush like this or like a relaxed brush. This is actually one of the reasons I went from retopologizing in Modo to retopologizing in Maya because Maya has a fantastic relaxing tool. It's very important when it comes to dealing with topology. There are of course ways around that, but um, yeah, it's really useful to have that. Tom Moore is asking, after retopology, did you put it back in ZBrush to project details back on, or can you do that in Maya? Yeah, you need to do that in ZBrush. You could technically do this in Maya using like uh, 
transfer attributes and such, but it's not a particularly good way of doing it. And also that wouldn't work with subdivisions. So yeah, you definitely need to do that. We have plenty of tutorials on, on YouTube as well on how to do this, like reproject details. So um, if you're interested in that, you can just look for tutorials on that. Now you can see I'm blocking in the loops, but I'm also being conscious of how they connect up. So instead of just going com doing completely random stuff here, I am I am conscious of it. And but this is why you start off low poly because then you can be conscious of this and it's not really a problem. If basically when you're doing retopology, you only add the loops that you need at this moment. Yeah, retopo flow for Blender is is great. But yeah, not built in. It's uh, it's like I don't know, seventy, eighty dollars or something. We have a we have a whole course on using that as well. We also have a um, tutorial on YouTube as well on how to use Retopflow. It's it's a good one. So you can see how fast it is to actually block things in once you're once you're just blocking in the main loops like this. going for 16 minutes now and includes about a minute of me just talking in the beginning. How do you go about retopologizing creatures that aren't very human? What you do is you you just start to block them in. You just start to block in the main loops. Uh, the, the rules of retopology or topology in general would still apply to that. There, there isn't, even though it's not a humanoid character, it would still work in the same way. You need even loops, you need it to deform properly. So you just kind of do the same approach as with humans. The only difference is the, the layout would be, would be a bit different, but you start off general to specific and we just work our way up from, from here to there. Just keeping it simple. Like there's nothing. There's nothing crazy if you're if you're retopologizing, like like an alien. Like speaking of that, that's what I did for Alien Covenant. I retopologized. Um, I worked on re the retopology for the um, for the xenomorph for that. And what we did for that is if we just same thing I'm doing now, right? Just block it in. Just get the loops around and just block that kind of stuff in. So the way the approach I'm using now is, is exactly how I've been retopologizing in like in the effects as well. General to specific. It's really cool in with quarter here that you just hold down the shift key and then you can, um, or sorry, the tab key, and you can just drag loops out as well. So, yeah, so I'm a little bit conscious just of how things can connect, but I'm not overly concerned about it. I'm just, just keeping in mind how, how things connect up. Yeah, so the streams we'll be doing like this have normally been um, about uh, just sculpting. You know, it's fun to do, fun to fun to talk to people about doing that while doing that. But it's also fun to to do something a bit different as well. So I think this is the first proper retopology stream we're doing. How do you go about doing retop of characters with complex clothing, like an oversized open jacket? Do you just separate them from the main character body? Yeah, so th this is a great question. Essentially, the question is is more, how do you, do you combine objects or do you keep them separate? And I prefer to keep things combined that are the same material in real life and a combined th and a separate things that are different materials. So for instance, let's say you're doing a like a watch or something like that. You have tons of different pieces in it. I would I would separate those out. But for a character like this, this is all just skin, right? And this one continuous surface. So in this case, the ears, same mesh as the, the head, but it kind of makes sense that the body is a separate piece than the, the clothing, right? Because when you put on clothing, like as a person, you, you your clothing, it doesn't merge with you. It's still a whole separate piece. So if you're doing something like clothing, you, you just retopologize those those areas by themselves. What you have to figure out specifically when it comes to, I guess with a lot of things, but like specifically clothing is you have to figure out if it's going to be sim based or not. Meaning are you going to be, is there going to be cloth sim on top of it? Or is it going to be, um, 
just just are you going to be baking in defaults into it this of course depends right if you're doing something for film you're probably going to do more sim based stuff meaning that you need to do more it needs to be more square well if you're doing something for games where you're not going to be simming it most likely then you need to bake in defaults so just trying to connect some of these guys up now but yeah, not going too in, in going too detailed with this yet because we still haven't done like the mouth and the ears and and such, right? So we just need to make sure to get this kind of stuff in. Yeah, the cool thing about Udems is that Painter now supports Udems, like fully supports Udems, which is great. Makes it a lot easier to, to work with, particularly with characters there. Because for, for that, you just need continuous Udems, so you can paint across the Udems. And you can export the Udems out, so yeah, Udems support in Painter is, is pretty good. So I'm just trying to get coverage in all areas. What you can see here as well is around the uh, the ear. I'm just making a whole loop just to keep that nice and simple. Just trying to find the center line. We will of course do this more mathematically <laughs> later on. Like once we once we're a little bit further ahead, then we'll find the, the center line using numbers instead of just eyeballing it. But for now, this is fine. So just getting this kind of stuff down, just trying to get the loops in. And you can see here, right, like this is for sure going to have to be split up. We're just trying to make, just trying to figure out the main loop layout for now. I'm working in a very methodical manner when it comes to this. We, you don't have to f have all the answers in the beginning because you're not even you have to like it you're just not going to be able to have all the answers in the beginning because street topology is, is complicated right like there are a lot of flows back and forth so just keep this light i was gonna say keep it playful but read topo isn't playful right it's just topology but um yeah keep it um keep it as playful as you can i suppose So you can see here, this stuff here obviously doesn't match up. And also we have the central line as well. That's not entirely defined at this point, but that's fine. Mr. Rigger asks me to avoid stars in the lazy label fold. I always find this a challenge. Any tips on that? Yeah, the tip there is, is honestly find a reference for it. Like with everything else in, in 3D, find reference for it, find a... Like it should be fairly straightforward to agree with Mr. Rigger what the Mr. Rigger wants because you you just find a pre-made base mesh, right? Like if particularly if you're in a production, then you will already have a pre-made base mesh. But if not, then like read topology in the blind like this and just kind of like that's what I'm doing now. I'm just kind of blindly working. I'm just doing what I think would work. But I, by blindly working, I mean that it's not tested, right? Like what I'm doing now is. We, you don't know if it's going to work or not because it's not been rigged yet. But what you can do, you can work with information instead. So you can uh, you can figure out what already works for other base meshes, and then you can just copy that. So we have a tr we have a star here. We're going to have some other stars elsewhere. In order to f find a better layout for that, just copy what somebody else is doing. There are some things here as well we can't really get to right away because we uh, we have the mouth here and the mouth is is close so we we have to do this not using quadro and have to be sure this stuff doesn't merge either basically you want to be sure that this doesn't happen because it's this is a this is a surface that is um it looks like it's in the same spot here but this if, if we were to blend this together to merge this then the character will not be able to open or close their mouth i guess closing is by default but they wouldn't be able to open the mouth 
And what I'm trying to do as well is I'm keeping the, the spans the same top and the bottom. Just to keep the formation nice and simple. This character realistic isn't going to deform. For this guy, I could have just zero meshed him because this is this guy here is purely going to be used for for um like he's gonna be a still image, right? We might make a tutorial about this guy, by the way, like how to sculpt him and texture him, basically the whole thing. I haven't decided on that yet, but I think that would be fun. Basically some kind of a riot or League of Legends style character, like the uh, the animated show. I think that would be really fun to do. Just like showing how to hand paint him, retopo him, all that kind of stuff. So I guess you are getting a preview of what that might be like. Because that chapter, if I, if, we, if we are doing that course, again, not decided, that chapter is going to be basically the same as this, right? Well, I'm going to be showing basically exactly the same approach. We might be using Blender instead of Maya. Don't know. Might be using Maya. But yeah, that's um, to be determined. The ear is always a pain to retop on. Such a complex shape. Oh yeah. <laughs> the ear sucks to do. The ear is just really painful. What I do with the ear is I kind of separate out this loop here. And then I, I only have this loop and then I, I just do the ear by itself. And then we try to, to copy it in or try to blend it in. Because it's, it's just a painful shape to do. What a lot of people do is they just have a pre-made ear and then they just kind of attach it to the, the head. <laughs> I do that often when, with hands and feet whenever I'm sculpting, where like I can't be bothered to to do hands and feet now. So I just find a model with already existing hands and feet and I just throw them in there. Just there's not gonna be that big of a difference between hands and feet anyway, so we might as well. You can see how slowly I'm actually working with this, right? I'm just kind of taking it one polygon at a time and just, just taking it easy. Just trying to match things up. My approach for retopology, which you might have heard before if you watch more of our videos, is slow is fast. Where if you if you slowly start to just block in these loops and you just focus on the loop layout and such, then at some point it's just going to be like boop, 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 and you're just solving the whole puzzle. In the beginning, I prefer to not really relax things too much. I prefer to just do this by hand. Of course, relaxing is a fantastic way of doing it, but I just like to control this a little bit more in the beginning. And remember to save. There seems to be a constant rigor shortage. Why do you think that is? Is that the task is generally not very entertaining? Personally, I think there aren't many online resources to start learning it. It's probably a mix of that where rigging is very technical and there are a lot of roles that people don't really know that there are lots of jobs in because they're they're kind of like, they're like not even so like supporting roles. They're, they're just not the most obvious roles. Like if you're starting with 3D, uh, you're just not going to know that grooming or rigging or like CFX and such a thing. You just know that you animate because obviously you have to animate. You have to build because you have to build. But how do you get a model that's ready to animate? Like, is there a step between modeling and animation? Maybe, right? But it's not. It's not necessarily intuitive that that that's the case. Or if you if you were to be starting off with 3D, would it be in like? We, this just an, a button that makes that ready for animation or anything like that. So it's it's just not a lot of roles like that are just not intuitive to know about. I think also a lot of people are scared off from rigging because of really bad teachers and rigging. If you teach rigging well, it's a very interesting topic. But if you just teach it in a all right, here is you have to just click all these buttons here and just fire up some scripts. And it, it does not a particularly interesting task when, when if it's taught that way. But if, you, if you're if you teaching it properly, I think it can be a very interesting, interesting thing. After the retop of a character, is there, is the, is there, 
don't know how to say this. Is the UV phase, is there a maximum amount of textures a character can have? There isn't really a maximum of textures. The maximum would be determined by basically your system, like your computer, how many you can run. But you also wouldn't want to be just gluttonous with it, right? You, you don't you don't want to just do crazy amount of textures just to do crazy amount of textures. If you were to have a character would be like this close up here for the head, I'd pro probably do like two or three UDIMs or something, you know, depending on, of course, on the... Like if you go, want to go this close up, that's a very different thing. But if it's like a, if it's a shot like this, two or three UDIMs, 4K is probably enough. But yeah, after retopper, then you would be doing UVs, and then you would be doing reprojection, projection, seabrush, additional sculpting, and texture painting at the same time. Well, not at the same time; it can happen simultaneously, like additional sculpting and texture painting. Like if you have multiple people working on it, you can then you can do that. Then you can also start doing the look as well, like the actual shader, as well. I think an issue here, like some people are mentioning, like university teachers and such or professors, is 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 inherently you just need to know so much as a teacher. If I were to be a university lecturer right now, I'm not sure if I would be a particularly good one because I would the the, the breadth of stuff I would have to to get good at is insane. Like expecting someone to be good at the entire pipeline is is bonkers like imagine if you need to get good at groom sculpting rigging but not just like the basics of it but actually hiring somebody who knows how to do characters to a to a professional level and also can do effects and all that kind of stuff it's it's absolutely bonkers that's why it's of course a really good idea to do like self-education like when you're in uni you use, use the teachers there for to learn maybe the software and to get a network and such but then if you know you want to be an effects artist you probably need someone like steven nipping or you need to just watch all the houdini tutorials you can find and if you want to be a character artist then you're going to be glued to flip normals and the other character art resources out there just because there aren't that many resources out there like i can very confidently say that we we have mm, the, the the tutorials we have on flip normals for character art are just much better than to the tutorials or the lecture you can have in any university in the world pretty much not even because like the stuff we have is good i'm confident about that but it's simply because there just aren't that many courses out there that actually offer proper character art so if you're if you're a professional character artist most likely you already you you have a job in the film or print or anything or something like that so they're just aren't that many courses or lecturers in in university focus on character art like i'm talking to the mentees i have and some of them are in university at the moment and they uh, they they just won't learn character art like if you go to university or school expecting to learn proper character art unless you're in a very specialized curriculum and you have very specialized teachers you're just not really going to learn that which you know is also kind of fair as well because it's you have to dedicate so much time to it to some degree so well you have to just do that you have to just get dedicate so much time to it so it wouldn't necessarily be fair to the other teacher or the other students to if you want to just focus on characters because the other ones would, would want to learn other things as well one of the reasons why character art is difficult to learn as well is because you just have to get really good at sculpting like you just you just need good sculpting skills and if you don't have that that's it's just really difficult to become a good character artist right just blocking it out 
one polygon at a time. But you can see now, right, we are 34 minutes into this, so like 30 something minutes into the actual retopo of this guy. And, you know, he's getting there. It's not terribly far away from actually being finished. So you can see how fast you can actually block things out. And I'm not like frantically working or anything. I'm not particularly stressed about this. I'm just kind of slowly blocking it out. Taking my time. All right, it's time to do a first delete history, but also just to actually do the center line. So this is where we are going to be selecting the actual center line for the various pieces we have, because currently this is a bit of a mess. All right, then we just select these guys, just two vertices, two vertices. Just make sure we have no stragglers. Then we'll go all the way up here, absolute transform, and set the X position to zero. What this does is, well, it puts the X position to absolute zero. So we just delete history again, and then we hit control one, and then we shift right mouse button, and then we do quarter. Remember, everything can be done through the shift right mouse button. You can actually see here, right, that like how clean the topology actually is. Like it's it's pretty nice, right? Pretty nice and simple topology for now. It's not done, but um, it's it's working so far. Will you be doing ears manually or using a base mesh? Uh, I've, for this, I'm definitely going to be do, doing this manually. Which is going to suck. <laughs> it just sucks to do to do ears. It's just a very annoying part of the process. But it is a part of the process and well it, it doesn't it, it sucks to do, but it just takes time. It's not necessarily crazy difficult. It just takes time. So that is where if I wasn't streaming right now, I would just be putting on a good podcast on a good audiobook or something like that and then just just go with that. So now at least we can be confident that the lines we have here, the, the center lines, are actually indeed in the center. Hey, just curious, are you, do we use CModeler in your workflow, in your character art? I, I don't really like CModeler, to be honest. I don't use CModeler whatsoever. I find it to be useful if I if I need to, if I have like a very, very basic model and I need to maybe add some, like a loop to it or something. But personally, I don't really like CModeler. I, I'm, I, I just model stuff in like Blender or Maya or something like that. Like I, I really, I personally don't have any use for CModeler. I know some people like it, uh, I, I don't, but... Uh, personal preferences. Basically, there's nothing I can't do in Maya that, that C modeler is really good at, I find. There are some, sure, some weird novel things, like if you extrude, it's gonna do some weird stuff there, but in general, it's it, it doesn't really add anything to my to a modeling arsenal. And then just making sure that we have the same loops, top and bottom. And for this, what you can do, you see this loop here, you can do an edit edge flow for on this. This puts it bang on in the center. You can do this on a few different ones as well. Edit edge flow is fantastic. We'll do a pass on that later on.
What do you think of plasticity? Yeah, it looks awesome. Uh, I haven't used it personally, but it looks looks like a fantastic tool. And if you get stuck with topology, which you are at some point, meaning that you're you're kind of retopologizing yourself into a corner, just delete the area. That's fine. What about triangles on the retopo? Triangles are fine as long as you know what you're doing. Uh, I I sometimes have triangles in like in areas where it doesn't deform, maybe on top of the head, like this guy here in Seabrush is gonna have hair. So on the back of the head here, for instance, hair is pretty work in progress. So in that sense, it's fine there. Back of the head, basically areas where it doesn't deform a whole lot. But yeah, obviously it depends on on if you're doing stuff for games or for film as well. For for games, you know, a bit of a different story there. Then you definitely, like since it's not, it doesn't subdivide, that's, that's a quite different story. For, um, what you want to avoid, though, 100% for doing characters, like no exception for at least as long as you're doing zebra sculpting, is you no end guns allowed whatsoever. The reason for that is a purely technical one. It's not a philosophical one or anything. It's just zebra does not allow for end guns whatsoever. It's going to convert them to triangles. So then you just you just can't have end guns. Select this, shift right mouse button, and edit edge flow. And that's going to just put it bang on in the center. Shift right mouse button, connect. Sorry, shift right mouse button and quadro. And then we have Mr. Quadro draw back. Is, I was wondering is there, if there was a reason no software is unable to compete with Seabrush for sculpting. Is because the underlying tech of Seabrush is too complex for something else or something else? So honestly, it's a bit hard to tell, right? I, mean, I don't really know because you had software like Mudbox that was very much competing with uh, with ZBrush, and then after this kind of killed it off. I guess it's officially not killed off, but if you look at the, the change logs for for it, like the latest version is something like slightly different Linux installer, so it's practically dead. But you do have some now, some some tools like Nomad for and Forger on uh, on the iPad, which looks really promising. Blender, of course, has some has scoping tools as well exactly why it's hard to tell right i don't necessarily think it's because the tech is so insane because it i mean seabrush is seabrush is sculpting tools the core tools are over 20 years old i mean seabrush came out in the late 90s so i don't see a reason why people wouldn't be able to recreate that to some degree maybe there just isn't a market for it or pixel logic or now maxon just have entirely cornered that market i personally think there's very much a market for a rational sculpting software because seabrush isn't rational seabrush is insane like in terms of ux it's it's, it's actually like nonsensical you it, it's so hard to learn compared to how, to how hard it should be to learn so if you were to have a tool that has the seabrush power like the actual power of the sculpting tools dynamite sculptors pro that kind of stuff but a modern ux something that's actually sensible i think you actually have a, a fairly strong case for for a good software there that might be what Adobe is doing with uh, with Substance Modeler. Uh, it looks cool. I don't really have any interest in VR sculpting, to be honest. I don't have a VR headset, so can't really comment on that. But um, yeah, I'd be I'd be very curious to see if there are if there are any more sculpting software coming out. There is a pretty cool one as well called Codon with a K, which is from from Norway. Really really cool software. Really cool guys. I tried it a few times, and uh, as VR sculpting, that's that's like legit. It's cool when you when you actually put VR goggles on you and you sculpt in in VR. Just a very different experience. Henning, do you recommend zero measure for starting as a starting point in for retopology? Nope. The reason is that it's going. It looks good. 
but it's not good. It's in nearly all cases, you're going to spend more time redoing the topology than you're going to have to spend just doing it from scratch. Like doing this, right? Like now we're 45 minutes into this and it's almost done in terms of the head. Like I probably have to spend like twice as much. Of course, we have the ear as well, but it doesn't take that much time. But the thing is with this is there are no surprises here, meaning that you could you can do this and you can estimate how much time something is going to take. Well, you can't estimate how, some, how much time something's going to take if you're doing this with C modeler. So I'd really don't like the C modeler topology. It's difficult to, to change and, uh, or C, sorry, C remesher, not C modeler. It's difficult to change and it's fine if you just need for, uh, for uh, for like temporary topology or something like that, you need to quickly get something out. But for final things, it, it's a nightmare to use. It spirals, and even if it doesn't spiral, it loops in weird ways. So particularly if you're doing any kind of production asset, I really don't like using C, uh, like C remeshing things like that. The problem with me is when I finish the head and I try to attach to the body, the edge count on the neck is different from the body. How do we fix this? Well, easy. You just do them at the same time. Like straight up, you just, you, you just do, don't do do them separate. You just do it as one holistic thing. You, of course, you could you could separate them out and such, but you definitely need like the, the lines to be the same so it connects up because otherwise it's going to be a real nightmare. For head topology or for body topology for full character topology i i always just use a base mesh for this it's it's so annoying how to deal with that particularly if you're dealing with hands and feet and such it just takes a long time to do and just a uh, reminder that we have a uh, very nice sale on more than 25,000 products almost 30,000 products which is on for today and tomorrow so here for instance we have introduction to anatomy which is a uh, course you learn how to make this guy here but also we learn how to do a significant amount of like just core anatomy as well knowing how the clavicles and scapula connect what are muscles we go through all the main muscles as well like the brachioradialis and extensor carpal radialis longus so bunch of different things here my hands as well talking about hands so we have a real nice sale introduction to sculpting is also one of the uh, all stars as well so definitely check out flip normals if you're interested in tutorials we also have one here this is a bit of an older one but here we have uh, we have um, retopologizing a full character we go through the whole workflow very similar to what we're doing now and uh, this is also retopologizing a head using retopo flow as well so this is in blender exactly the same workflow as we're using now we're just using retop flow so you know you learn this whole thing how to do this whole thing from scratch What if people use Blender for sculpting instead of ZBrush? What's the main reason you choose one over the other? ZBrush is just a better software for sculpting. It's much, much more feature rich. The sculpting tools are much more refined. It's an active development, which as far as we can tell, there isn't really any anything being done in Blenderland in terms of sculpting as well. So yeah, ZBrush is just a much, much, much more refined product, more refined product in the sense that Blender is a much more refined product when, when it comes to animation, right? Can't do everything. You can do it to a decent level. We have actually a whole tutorial on that as well, on how to sculpt in Blender as well. So see if you can find that in a sec. So we have, um, yeah, just learn how to sculpt in Blender. 
Blender, Blender is still a good sculpting tool. It's just that ZBrush isn't a good sculpting tool. ZBrush is an absolute world class sculpting tool. Like it, it's not like kind of decent in terms of digital sculpting. It's, it's just undisputed the best tool out there. Purely for sculpting. In terms of UX, is it's garbage. <laughs> in terms of uh, the um, like, it's in terms of how hard it is to learn as well. It's it's just difficult to learn. But once you know it, if you were to have a somebody with Blender or somebody with ZBrush next to each other, the, uh, the and you know same sculpting skills, the the, the ZBrush artist would just be able to take it much 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 further. Our written reviews ever come back to Flip Normals? It was fun checking out what people had to say about a product. At some point, they are coming back. We we had we rebuilt the whole site over the last year, which launched in December, December twenty seventh last year, and we we've been rebuilding it feature by feature. So it was missing a lot of features when it launched back then. But now, we, over the last few months, we've been rebuilding the the site piece by piece and adding new features to it. So. It will be coming back at some point. It's not coming back anytime soon though. So um, we stopped development on the site so we can focus more on um, tutorials and YouTube and all that kind of stuff. But uh, yeah, they're not coming back right away, but they're definitely coming back at at some point. But we, the way we did reviews now is we, we just did them as ratings instead. We, we definitely want to do both, but um, the cool thing about ratings is we get a lot more of them. It's much easier just to add a little rating. So. Um, you can quite accurately see the the ratings for for a tutorial and for a product now on on Flip Normals. There's just a lot more data here, but of course we want to if you bring it back or when we bring it back, we're going to be bringing it back as um, as both right as ratings and reviews. Here's what you can do as well. You can go in here and you can just cut this up. So instead of needing to do a whole loop, the uh, the whole thing start to finish, you can do. You can just do one and you can do one and it creates an end gone and we can fix that later on. Creating end guns is like I just said before, right? Like their end guns are illegal in like in a in a very real sense and technical sense, right? Seabrush simply just doesn't support end guns. But from a temporary work point of view, Maya supports end guns, right? So it's a very good way to quickly solve your your loop issues and then you can go in and you can you can start to to fix that stuff later on. Now you can see, for instance, now we have two quads here, or two sort of two lines going up here. That means we can very easily turn this into a into quads as well. Can just go in here. We can do a uh, this multi cut. Cut this in. It's going to snap to it now, and we can just leave these guys for now. Which is better? Which is better software for start learning rigging and animation? In terms of the industry standard for purely these two tasks right now, like it's it's without a doubt Maya. Uh, Blender is is getting good at a lot of different things, but in terms of just pure animation and rigging, like Maya is still miles ahead of that. And also in terms of the industry, like in terms of someone just mentioning before when the whole like rigging question came up, that rigging is very software specific. Sure, you can't translate your skills, but you can't translate a rig. So if a rig is done in Maya, the rig is gonna have to be done in Maya, or the animation is gonna have to be done in Maya. So you're entirely locked into the software when it comes to rigging and animation. So if, you're, if you wanna be a rigger or an animator today, I highly, highly, highly recommend sticking with, with Maya. Once the Blender is good enough there, then you know go for it, but at this point, Maya is much better. I don't have experience personally with that, I'm not an animator nor rigger, but from having talked to both animators and riggers, they're just saying that it's uh, Maya is nowhere, or Blender is nowhere near Maya at the moment. Has anyone here checked out PRX rigging animation courses? So again, not an animator or rigger, but I talked to a lot of people who have, and I've seen all the reviews from it. Like back when we had the reviews on the site, and it's 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 a fun, well, they're fantastic courses, both the the rigging course and the alive animation course. But PRX absolutely brilliant courses. So if you're interested in that, 
like uh, learning animation and rigging, like those are probably two, two of the best courses like made on, on that. And hey, they're using Blender as well. All right, so we have coverage over nearly the whole thing now. So once you have coverage, then you need to do it better. Then you need to uh, improve the whole thing. You need to soften off the whole thing and uh, go over everything and just, just improve the, the whole, the whole uh, model. And that is where the relax brush comes in. You can very easily go in and do this. Just relaxing this whole thing. If you hold on a shift key on the border, you can also just relax the border as well. For this, I'm not actually going to be using this. I'm going to be using the edit edge flow tool. Edit edge flow is fantastic. You can just hide it from here and then edit edge flow right here. You can do this on a few of these guys as well. This, of course, is going to mess up the uh, the snapping of the back on the the mesh, but that's fine. We can work with that. Cool. We can you can see stuff still slides here, which is pretty cool. All right, and then we can try to fix this kind of stuff. Not the cleanest way to deal with it, but it will do. For me, retopology and Blender and Maya are honestly quite similar, particularly if you have like um, the um, retopo flow in Blender. I, I still, I still prefer Maya. I still think Quadro is 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 a better tool than than retopo flow and and the and um, the general Blender tools. But it, it's you're gonna get the same results for it. So if you it, the thing is, you wouldn't really choose tools based on that. Like if you use a Maya then you're doing Retop and Maya. If you're doing Blender, you're doing Retop and Blender. You're not going to learn a separate tool for that. There isn't there isn't really a big difference between these two, to be honest. So you're, not, you're simply just not going to be switching tools based on that. So it, if, in that sense, it doesn't really matter which one is best or not, because it, it it's just kind of irrelevant. It would be like, which is best at animation Maya or Blender. Well, if the rig is made in Maya, it doesn't matter, right? So just keeping it simple, right? What I'm doing now is I extracted this area here just so that we can only deal with this part and then I can do the dreaded ears. Just so we have a, an idea of where it connects up. So what is Blender actually good for if all the all the main things are better done in just standard software? I mean it's it's a fantastic software. It's and, and not everything is better in, in in tools like Maya or Houdini or something. Blender is probably for pure concept art, is probably the best art tool ever made. Absolutely fantastic. It's also very strong modeling tools. In many many people argue that Blender is a stronger modeling tool than Maya, and I mean, rightfully so. You have like brilliant plugins for for Blender for modeling. So yeah, it's, it's a strong software. But also you have tools like um, like grease pencil as well that you, you don't really have in the equivalent to that in Maya at least not to the same degree so it's it's a very different kind of tool the the fact that you can do like quote unquote everything in blender you can't do it necessarily to the highest level you know, like you can in in more specialized software yes you you can't do sculpting to the same level in in blender as you can do in ZBrush but 
a lot of times you don't need that, right? Like if you, we're talking about which is the best sculpting tool in that sense, we are assuming you're working at an elite level where you need to, you just need to sculpt the best characters you can for AAA games or for movies or something. But a lot of times for sculpting, you can sculpt great characters in Blender as well, don't get me wrong. But a lot of times what you need is you, you need to bash up some rocks or something or just do some sculpting or some cloth or something like that. It's fantastic. So the strength of Blender like Blender isn't isn't an expert software in anything. Like it's not a specialized software, but the fact that it is so, it covers so much ground, is a real real competitive advantage of Blender. That the fact that if you're a small shop or a freelancer or something like that, you can do really most things within the software. But yeah, if you're comparing it to to Houdini when it comes to effects, it's, it's obviously it can't compete there, right? It's Houdini is a is a entirely specialized software when it comes to effects it would be entirely unreasonable to assume that it could compete with that. Maya has also, also been used for every single game and movie production the last uh, 20 years, right? It's just a refined product in that sense. But um, no, Blender, Blender is good. And also just honestly, the fact that it's free, you can't take away that as well. You can't take away that. That's a huge, huge part of it. I'm very new to sculpting and still getting used to ZBrush itself. When should I start worrying about more technical aspects like topology and UVs? What you can do, instead of just focusing on getting good at sculpting, then getting good at like topology or UVs as a linear thing, you can you can do that in a, in a different way. This is how I how, how I learned it. Just build a ton of projects. Just just build tons of, of interesting things. Like try to, it doesn't have to be perfect, right? But try to sculpt a fun character and then re topologize it and then texture it right then you you learn it along the way there isn't really an event where you learn 3d it's not like you watch the tutorial and now you're like oh cool i went from not being a sculptor to being like a professional sculptor it's, it's a gradient you you learn a little bit here uh, from one project then you do another project you learn a little bit there you watch a tutorial you learn a little bit there you apply the tutorial so it, it's all it, it's all just iterative so don't worry too much about about no about learning things in a in a highly compartmentalized way like that just just do tons of projects just build tons of cool things stuff you find to be interesting and then then you can do studies as well like if you if you if you need to get better at pure sculpting then do figure studies if you need to get better at retopology you can do a pure retopo study and such but i i just find it to be best to just just output a lot like when learning just output a lot just work a lot create all sorts of cool things. Do things you find to be interesting. Houdini is also much cheaper than all the Autodesk products. I don't think it is. I don't think Houdini is cheaper than at least for you know the full versions of it. I don't think it's a, it's not a it's not a cheap product. You do have very good personal learning editions and such, but it, it's not a. I mean that's obviously something you can fact check very quickly. But uh, Houdini is definitely not a cheap software. I could check, but uh, I'm working now. Yeah, this is exactly what I was talking about. This is a very good question and it kind of relates to what we just discussed. Should I download Maya just for retopology or should I do it in Blender with some add-ons? Well, first off, Maya is hella expensive, right? It's like three and a half thousand dollars a year. Indie version is like $200. So just using that for for that is is pretty insane so you know assuming you're buying it then that that's 
doesn't really make too much sense. But you also just have to learn it. You can't just use it for retopology. Like you actually have to learn navigation, scene system, and all that kind of stuff. It's not like there is a retopo mode here. You actually have to learn how to use Maya. So this is exactly what I meant with the whole. It doesn't really matter if Maya is better or not than than other tools at retopology because it's. It would be like if you try to separate out every single part of the of the process into separate software it's just not going to work if you're if you're retopologizing in if you if you're modeling in maya you're going to be retoping maya you're going to be uv mapping in maya unless you need highly specialized tools for that so i recommend just sticking to just sticking to the, the main software you're using in this case if you're using blender just stick with add-ons or blender also keeps it just simple as well. Tools are constantly getting updates. You have to keep on on top of things to learn that. If, if I want to, if I, if you were using a specialized retopo tool, I would much rather use like Topogun or something like that. Like Topogun three is like out or beta, something like that. So you, then you have a specialized retopo tool that basically only does retopo. I definitely wouldn't use Maya only for the retopology tool. Like this this stream here would have been basically exactly the same if I was using this, if I was doing this in Blender or not, or in Maya. It's very little difference in, in like actual practical terms because a polygon is a polygon is a polygon. Like it, there is, it's just vertices, right? With um, edges in between them. There's nothing like crazy different about them, particularly for this. If you're doing something like, like a lot of tubes or something, then it, it there is a bit of a difference because then you, um, you might need some specialized tools that I think you have in Retopoflow and such. But in terms of the stuff we're doing here, it's just manual grunt retopology. There's nothing, you can't really automate this, at least not today. Any advice on keeping focus while longer sculpting sessions? Sometimes my mind don't want to think about sculpting, but start thinking about random stuff, then goes like autopilot. Yeah, it's really, really helpful to do time box things where you're spending like 20 minutes on one piece, then you're taking a break, 20 minutes on another piece, taking a break. I actually have like a timer on my phone that just gives me like a 20 minute timer. For sculpting, I can basically sculpt for like unlimited amount of time because I've been doing this for such a long time, but I, there are a lot of stuff for, for work where you know flipped almost where I just need to to just have the timers because I keep getting distracted as well so 20 minutes seems to be a pretty good sweet spot for me when it comes to that but also just work on different parts 20 minutes work on the arm 20 minutes work on the face and just keep doing that over and over again you definitely don't want to go on autopilot when it comes to sculpting And like I mentioned right in the beginning of the stream, the uh, this model here has some issues. The ear is way, way, way too thick. So unless I fix that, that's going to cause issues in shading. And um, it's an interesting one, right? When it comes to it, because it, you don't necessarily think about the model being a part of the shading, but but it is. The look dev has already begun at this stage. The, the choices you make at this point is going to affect the look dev quite a lot. Like already in modeling. Everything is connected. This is one of the key things I keep keep talking about in all tutorials about uh, texturing. A good model makes texturing so much easier. If you're under modeling something, then you're gonna have to over texture. You're gonna have to overcompensate with textures, which is going to not look good because in that case you're 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 using the wrong tool for the job. If a, if a character just needs more mid frequency, then you, you can't really out texture that. You can't really fix that issue with uh, with just better texturing. You just need more variety in the uh, in the, the in the sculpt. Where can I learn things like topology? Well. We have a lot of tutorials on YouTube. We also have a lot of commercial tutorials as well. We we have one, let me show you this one. We have one that came out um, last year, about a year ago, which is this one here, character Realistic Character Portrait Masterclass. This one here covers how to do this guy here. This is on sale as well now, 30% off. 
this is uh, you learn how to make this whole character from scratch like from a from basically a sphere and then you we just take him through all the steps including this is in blender including retopology as well showing you how to do this kind of stuff in blender how to make a how to make a professional layout I just yeeted my mouse off my desk there for a sec <laughs> and doing the uvs in blender as well in blender and seabrush and then just texture painting him so like this course here i, I highly recommend i'm going to send a link to this in the chat Yeah, well, the steps for retopology, you can go back into this uh, stream here as well, and you can see the different steps, because, you know, I'm doing this whole character from, from scratch now. So the steps are, you know, pretty repeatable on, on really any character. I'm not doing anything, like, novel here. Like, this is all just just retopology, just good old concepts. If you see that strip that keeps happening, that's because if you hold on a tab key and you draw, you get a strip of polygons, but also the tab key and you hold you hover over a point like that, it's going to either extrude or it's going to extrude a vertex or from the vertex or it's going to extrude a, a proper proper um, uh, strip of polygons or just a polygon. So it's really annoying when I accidentally hit that. Then we're going to going to show a cool trick now. So what you can do, not a cool trick, it's a retopology trick. So what you can do now is you can fill in some holes. So just hit one line here, fill hole, we filled in all of this. Actually, before that, we have to bridge some stuff together. So let's multi-cut here, and then we bridge this to bridge this to this bridge, and then we can do a fill hole here, and then we can bridge this to this or connect this up. So just connect, and then we could basically just want to fill in all the holes. So we can just fix this. So this, hit the G key, fix this, G, and I think all the holes are fixed. And then, since we, we're still sliding onto the background geometry, we can start to just use the multi-cut tool to just cut this kind of stuff in. So we can do this and this, and we can do connect. Just hit the enter key. And we can use multi-cut. Multi-cut is, is a brilliant, brilliant tool. It's by far my favorite like, cutting tool of, of any cutting tool in any 3D software. Bit of a weird thing to have a favorite cutting tool, but uh, it is what it is. If you, if you do a lot of 3D and use a lot of 3D software, a good cutting tool is something you just appreciate. You can also use connect over here as well. If you prefer an interface. Multicut is also one of these tools I, I keep to hotkey as well. I don't have this right now, but uh, it's something. It's something when I do. I do when I do a lot of modeling. I always put this in a hotkey. I use Alt and C for that. The ear is going to just get messy. There's just no no way about that. Like it, it's just gonna be. It's going to be a bit messy, but also it's also where polygons can come to die because the inside of the ear, nobody's ever going to see. So you can keep that quite simple. Oh, we missed a hole. So fill hole. And then here, this is where we can do our little trick from before. We can do this. What's interesting about topology is that production topology looks quite different from portfolio topology because production topology is yeah this works it deforms well or you need some additional loops here and there and uh, it doesn't always look particularly good it's very functional but it doesn't look particularly good while or can of course look good but often doesn't and then you have portfolio topology that's supposed to look as pretty as possible so i always tend to like think about is either you optimize in topology for humans to look at or you're optimizing it for computers to read We have an end gun here now, and that's fine because we can fill in a triangle, kill a triangle there later on.
Okay, we have a lot of stuff here that we have to resolve. But luckily we have n-guns up here that this is going to connect beautifully up to. So what we can do, we can just do multi-cut and just start to cut from here and cut up here. This is one of the beauties of the multi-cut that it actually just cuts through the whole thing. We can do a cut here, we can do cut. And then we actually just need to redirect this a little bit, that's fine. Here you can see the advantage of actually having used a uh, like a piece of uh, mesh from of the mesh from the other one that we actually have a line going around this so we can much more easily see what's going on. All right, so we still have some stuff, some weirdness going on, which we can definitely fix. Let's try this. Okay, end gone and end gone. So we can probably connect these two up. If you have a lot of end gones, that's actually an advantage when it comes to retopology because you're gonna have to figure out where to redirect some loops. So if you have a lot of end gones, this is this is where you can you can you can often kill two end gones by quadding two things up. Yeah, for instance here, we can just redirect this one up like so. This is what I do a lot, I just cut things in. So if I have to redirect some loops, I just cut them in. Once you once you feel comfortable with the multi-cut, it's an incredibly powerful tool. Like the same thing if you're using Blender Right or any other tool, if you're using the knife tool in Blender or anything like that, same thing. You can also find end goals automatically, mesh. This doesn't always work for some reason. Mesh, clean up, reset, and then just select, and then faces some more four, and then just apply, and now you can see all of these guys. You might not know where all of them are, those hit the B key, and now you can start to see that it lights up like this. So here we have, basically have three clusters of endcons. We have down here, here, and here. Okay, just trying to see if I can find a clever way of solving this. Sometimes what you do, you just do this and you just create a triangle. Ta da! <laughs> this is this is a kind of it's not even the lazy way of doing it. Sometimes just it's a smart way of doing it. All right. Let's do this test again. Apply. Two end guns here. Let's see if there's a clever way we can solve this. Quad. Perfect. This is how I often do it in terms of troubleshooting. I just keep going until I find a solution. And there we go. All quads. Apply. And then we have down this down here as well. Gonna put this actually all the way up here like so. We're gonna make this shoot outwards. Cool. So just double checking we don't have any end guns and we don't. Cool. And then we do this and then we do this and then we do a little combine and then we are back in business. And now you can see that this is not gonna match up perfectly, right? And that's fine because this is not expected to merge up perfectly. This is where we, we just, we can now start to distribute things up. And this is kind of my approach for doing an ear. You always need to modify this after you've been doing this, after you've been combining and all this, just because it gets really messy. So 
So I'm just trying to find clever ways of combining this kind of stuff. But keep in mind the back of this, this is where he has his hair. Never going to be able to see this as well. So this is just some fast troubleshooting, just f trying to figure out what we can do with this. Alright, so one more end goes over, over here as well, and uh, we'll probably have to redirect some of these loops later on, but that's that's fine. This is not by any stretch of the imagination perfect, but it's okay. You see it's getting far, far, far too dense here now. So you want to be a little careful with adding density because of the ear. So like this is where you can choose between between two two evils right you can either choose between having a um having more resolution having weird topology in the ear or you can have choose between having weird topology in the eye in this case you always always choose weird topology in the ear because the eye is just much more important so you can see how much i'm actually using just the the multicut tool instead of just using quadro it's very powerful. And then if you have areas like this, which is too sparse, then you just have to fill this in a little bit. But before that, I'm just going to do a little pass with the edit edge flow. Which again is going to mess up the shape a little bit, but that's okay. We can always just re uh, reapply it. So just double double clicking and just hitting the G key. Just keeping this nice and simple. In this case, this is where you just need more topology. When you have crazy stretch stuff like this, you just need more topo here, which I'm probably not gonna do. <laughs> so, because uh, this is just a little topology streaming, not a perfect asset streaming. What software do you prefer for UV mapping? Uh, Maya, I prefer Maya for UV mapping. Maya is, Maya is solid for UV mapping. Basically what happened is some, some years ago, like, I don't know, 10 years ago now, I think it was like 2014, they um, they integrated uh, a modeling plugin called a modeling toolkit and um, Nex it was called. And so that this is basically Nex. What you have here, you, you turn Maya from kind of crappy modeling to really, really good at modeling. Maybe not really, really good at modeling. It became a good polymodeler. So, you know, don't want to overstate this. Uh, it's, it's a good polymodeler, but, you know, it, it's not like crazy new or anything like that. It, it doesn't have a... Where you, if you want to see cool modeling stuff, then you have a lot of cool add-ons for Blender. Like, not, you know, actual add-ons. So, like box cutter and a lot of these ones, these, these ones here. 
they're really, really interesting in terms of that. But yeah, Maya was pretty rough for quite a long time. I'm just trying to redirect these ones so they doesn't go down so much. And again, edit edge flow is brilliant at this kind of work. Will you be keeping these live channels up on your channel? Yes, absolutely. We have a you have a few as well. I did one yesterday as well where I was sculpting a character, sculpting some kind of hag character, and um, did a lot over the uh, during the summer sale as well, which was really fun. So we have a lot of these streams now up on the channel. This stuff here is just getting messy now. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just delete it. <laughs> just remove this whole thing. Whenever you delete something, that's when you start to see patterns. So I don't know how to fix this for now, but that's also fine because we don't have to have a solution to absolutely everything right away. So often just going in and just nuking what's there helps a ton. What you need as well for this is you need to go through here and and make the inside of the mouth. So I'm not going to do a crazy amount of work on this right now, but you, what you you really just want to be sure that you actually have the inside of the mouth. Because otherwise the character can't open his mouth. Same with the nose as well. You really want to be sure that you have the cavity in here as well. Surprise cylinder. Yes, yeah, so in this case, we just want to be sure that we have this and we just extrude this up a little bit and just put this into his, into his head. You want this to go quite high up because otherwise the, um, and you want to be to the nose to not be too thick as well because that's also going to mess up shading but also not too thin because then it's going to be real difficult to project things. Then you just go in here and you just fill hole and then we let these polygons up here just die. This is where we can just don't rec really recommend doing this, but you can just do this and this and just triangulate them. Then you can of course go through every other, just delete them. Hopefully we can make some, get some free quads. We can't always, but you know, sometimes we can. But it's in the inside of the nose, right? You know, pick your battles. All right, it's in a fairly decent spot now. It's still too uneven here. So we're just going to go in and do a little edit edge flow in this whole thing. This is why you want to keep the ear as low poly as you can for as long as possible because this gets very annoying. For some reason this vertice doesn't want to get deleted and then it, the whole area needs to die. So we do select this fill hole, which for some reason doesn't work either. Aha, so okay, something funky is going on here. Don't know what, but something funky is going on. Then we just delete until we figure out what's going on. Could be that it's not properly merged. So we just go through and we just merge it. Let's try this. Yeah, something just wasn't merged correctly. Connect is also something you definitely want to keep on a hotkey. It's a very useful tool.
Wouldn't a closed mouth result in issues on texture baking? Uh, not really. Not if you not if you didn't do it correctly. Like not if meaning if you notice as long as there isn't like crazy intersection or something like that, which of course there shouldn't be. There shouldn't be intersection because because you're gonna model it this in the same way as you should ideally work in real life, and real life doesn't intersect. So as long as you're careful with intersections, you it should be you should be pretty okay. But also when you you need to, you shouldn't really model for baking necessarily. It's not for this. You need to model for for what rigging prefers. You could of course do a separate version for purely for for baking. Like we, if you do have baking issues, then you can open the mouth and such. But what the model you're building is is so that it can be animated and rigged, right? So if there are issues with that, then like like the, the, that's what you should optimize for essentially. All right, then we need to do the same thing for the eyes as well. Oops, and something else seems to be selected. Maybe not. Maybe we just have to reset the tool a little bit. Yeah, it's a bit of a weird sometimes. Sometimes the, the pivot is, is off. Honestly, not sure what's happening here, why the pivot is off. The The fix for this has usually been to just delete the uh, the preferences or something like that. But yeah, something like this would be fine. Then we do an extrusion, then we do a merge, and this merge sits to the center. And yeah, sure, you should quad this up, but I'm not gonna. <laughs> hey Henning, how do you like Topogon? Haven't used Topogon in, in a very long time because first Moto got good at Retopo and then Maya got good at Retopo. I used it, I used version 2, which I suppose is either the current or the most recent version of it, or the most the last version. But uh, yeah, good. It's, it's a very good software for Retopology. If you do a with any kind of specialized tool like that, if it comes to Topogun or RISM for UVs or anything like that, I find it to be good if you do it a lot. If you only do it occasionally, I find it to be quite insane to to use specialized tools for that. Meaning, if you do, were to do retopo like once a once a month or something, once every other month, then I don't think there's any point in doing that. But if you do it like every day, this is what you're sitting and doing, then you can like quite uh, then you can improve your productivity quite a lot. But if not, then yeah, just get good at what you're doing. Don't try to optimize too much. Because the issue with additional tools, like again, RISM with um, Topogun, is just that you just need additional tools, additional licenses, new stuff to learn if stuff updates. So it gets a bit annoying to deal with this. Aha, here you can see an issue with, uh, with the, what I'm just doing here with the uh, adding this because um, I'm just gonna actually delete this because when we start to add more loops now you see it's not ready for it so then it, it starts to mess up so all the stuff here just needs to go it's a little bit faster on trigger but honestly fine because this is stupidly simple to fix the reason this is going a little haywire is because it's uh, the background, it hasn't snapped properly to the background yet. All right, so this is starting to get there. 
it's uh, I'm pretty happy with this. Now we are. Let's check OBS here. We are bang on an hour and a half into this into this one here. An hour and thirty four minutes into the whole stream. So pretty much an hour and a half into into this this thing here. So pretty happy with how far we'll be getting at that point. So now I'm just gonna do the center line again. We're not gonna go as long as we did went yesterday. We're we streamed for an hour and a half. Just gonna finalize this guy. Just making sure nothing silly is happening here, and then we're gonna center it. It's a good idea as well to do mirror tests once in a while because it's really difficult to know exactly what this looks like without. So merge threshold 0 0.01, and then you can just see what's going on. Just set the wireframe to be enabled, and now you can see it goes up, and then it's too messy. So the center line definitely needs more work in in this way, which you know is fine. We can we can always fix this, but yeah, definitely do these kind of uh, these kind of tests throughout. Oh, and wireframe is on. Needs to go. The density of your topology also depends heavily on the um, the the usage of the model. So if you're if you're uh, going to be articulating the model in this area here, for instance, then you're going to need more topology in this area. Currently, this is too light, so you definitely would need more topology here. And sometimes you don't need more topology down here, so you can just cut in things like like this here. Right? You can just cut things in like so, just so you have more resolution. You can even do additional ones, so you just have a lot more resolution up here. Do you think it's worth going for masters in game art? My parents want me to do it, but I feel like I won't learn much new stuff. Depends entirely on your situation and on where the master is. A lot of master programs are not very good and they're very expensive. It also depends on your financial situation. For instance, I've seen this a lot where parents want wants kids to go to university, but they don't want to pay for it. <laughs> like masters in the UK for like an international, I think it's like it's like seventeen thousand pounds or something. I'm not exactly sure the exact cost, but it, it's like it's really not cheap unless it's for one year course. So it, it's it really it really depends. If you feel like if you feel like you didn't learn a lot from taking a bachelor, you're not gonna learn a crazy amount from a master's most likely. So I I I'm always very reluctant to recommend it recommending a master's though I, I was in Bournemouth recently in the UK and I, I was I had a day of sculpting there in front of the master students and there were some really good people there and that seems to be a fairly decent master course though I, I was only there for one day so I can't accurately give any proper descriptions of that but yeah Bournemouth seems to be decent but I'm just skeptical of Bournemouth or of like not Bournemouth I'm just skeptical of uh, master courses in general particularly if you didn't learn too much from uh, previous courses and Particular if you're gonna have to be foot, uh, footing the bill yourself. It's it's a bit of a generational gap. Like if you're if you're if you have parents who force who want you to go there and you might be like early twenties or late teens or something, there's just a huge huge generational gap between the realities of education now when versus when your parents were attending uni. Like today, university is uh, globally is just much 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 more expensive unless it's in a country where it's free but even then it's still much more expensive because housing is much more expensive right so it's education is a tricky one to deal with today the problem one of the problems with education is that culturally it hasn't really changed it's still more like well you should go to school and get, get an education but the, the the financials have changed drastically so we it became much more expensive to attend uni but that wasn't reflected in the culture. It's still just like, yeah, just go to university, get a degree. And uh, the whole like, maybe from the 70s or 80s or something, you just get a part-time job and you just pay for Harvard with your waitress job, right? It does not work like that anymore. Education is very, very expensive. At least in a lot of different places. So happy to answer more questions there as well. But uh, 
for for like taking a masters, I it, I really think you need to have like a reason for doing it. the The default is you're not doing it, and there needs to be a good reason for doing it. Yeah, if you if you're at the if you've been taking a three year bachelor and you didn't learn a crazy amount you're not going to learn a crazy amount in the masters as well like one year is kind of how long it takes to build a good portfolio so if you that means that you 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 have can't really learn a crazy amount and build a portfolio in that year it's very difficult it's doable but you need if, if that's the case it needs to be a very good master's program where they just you work a lot great lectures and uh, you just get projects out the door right away Yeah, the reason I'm not very favorable towards educations is it's not because I, I have something against it by principle, but just because of the stories like you're telling here, right? Like you, you attended school, you didn't learn a whole lot. I, I've just seen this so many times. But you know, if you were to go, go to a good school, good education, it's great. You know, nothing against that out of principle. I mean, I attended school, I attended university, it's great. Would do that again, but needs to be a good one. <laughs> You're not just going to do it by default. So just going over this now with Edit Edge Flow, just to make sure this this just flows a little bit nicer. Oops. Okay, there is something here. Um, stuff might not be connected. What you can do if you have issues with stuff being connected, just do a merge, merge vertices, and add the, um, just do a uh, tiny radius here. And it looks like the radius here is too small, or maybe the model is just really small. So just doing a bit of a merge here. Can you tell me more about Edit Edge Flow? Edit Edge Flow is the best tool ever made. So if you were to have, it's not it's not used just for live surfaces at all. It doesn't actually snap to anything. What it does is, let's say you have a line right here. You have a line right here. And um, then this goes out here. If you shift right mouse button, Edit Edge Flow, it's gonna put it in the center. Basically, it's gonna look at this line it's going to look at this line and it's going to put it in the average of that. So it's very, very useful. For instance, if you were to rotate this one now, take this and you rotate this and you take the other one and you rotate this this way as well. Now this is going to be the average of these two. So it's a phenomenally useful tool because it doesn't work particularly well with the border edges. It goes a little crazy there. That's why I added these ones here. But it's a very, very useful tool. So for instance, if you were to have some loops like this, they're a little bit all over the place. You can just kind of go through here and edit edge flow and if you do this enough just hit the g key a few times it's just going to distribute it very nicely along so that's edit edge flow for you so i, I do this a lot to get a very nice distribution of uh, of polygons Yeah, so it's, uh, it's in a pretty good spot right now. I would need some additional resolution around the eyes just because of it's gonna articulate more. So probably just need a few more loops around the eyes as well. But um, it's honestly in a quite good spot at the moment. And once you do the edit edge flow, you have to go through and I'm probably not gonna do that now either, <laughs> but you have to go through and uh, be sure that it uh, it does snap to the surface. If it doesn't snap to the surface, you are in trouble. Yeah, here's somebody talking about Full Sail University. Full Sail is one of those. I'm extremely skeptical towards. I mean, first, I believe there have been some lawsuits. I'm entirely sure there, but for, like there are a lot of for-profit schools that are insanely expensive. So it's if you like 
at least the ones in the UK, they're their cost the same and they don't cost even remotely the same as some of the like for profit universities in the US. Alright, cool. I'm just gonna do a little bit more work on this and then we're gonna call this guy done. So get your questions ready and then I'll see how many I get to when it comes to answering them. All right, cool. And then we just set this to center and then we do a final merge and then we are gonna do a uh, just review and it's not perfect down here and this definitely merged it too much. So we just have to figure that out. All right, so that's the character for now. Then you go in here and you set this to harden edges just so you can properly see the model. And um, yeah, that's it for uh, for now. Now, before we finish off, I'm probably just gonna have take a few more questions, but also just a reminder that we have a very nice back to school sale right now. And um, then, uh, which we have almost 30,000 products, 25,000 plus products here. We have uh, the Realistic Character Portrait Masterclass. We have uh, Retopology with Retopoflow. And we just have a bunch of different products. So I highly recommend that you check that out if you're interested in really cool tutorials, 3D models, resources, and all that. Here's a good one as well by Hugh and Son, how important is networking to get into the industry and how would you approach it? Honestly, networking is, I find the best, just just do good work and don't worry too much about all the articles on networking, how to build a network through LinkedIn or something. Just, just do good work and you're gonna have a much better chance than if you just try to over-optimize networking. A lot of people, most people I find who, who get jobs, they just get jobs by just applying for it and then they, um, they get interviews and such, and then they show turn us out to be a pretty good person with that. And that just helps a ton. So networking is not something you should over optimize. But cool, that's it for uh, for today. We've been going for um, about almost two hours now. So you can find the stream on on YouTube as well afterwards. And thank you so much for your questions and for, uh, for joining the stream. It's been a pleasure. And here is the final model with the final topology. So yeah, cool. Uh, make sure to check out the uh, the website and um, the uh, back to school sale. And uh, hopefully I'll see.